Next up is Alan Tsukoni with his really, really, really uh, secret, secret title. Alan, what are we going to talk about? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Big applause to Alan. <laughs> Bigger! Thank you. That was the worst introduction ever, but oh. you know, we, can, we, can, we can work wait, with that. Wait, okay. Introduction. That, a tiny story to int introduce Alan. One day, I was at GDC Europe, and Alan comes to me and was like, Hey, Sauce, I'm going to talk about game jams. Do you want to do a game jam <laughs> with us on stage while we give a talk at this really scary event? I'm like, how much time do I have? 60 minutes. I'm like, okay, I can do that. I made games in 60 minutes before. So then, like, the next morning, he comes up to me. Sauce, can you still do that? I'm like, how much time do I have? 40 minutes. I'm like, mm, I guess so. <laughs> so then, like, before the talk, I'm waiting in the first row. And Alan was like, okay, Sauce, come to the stage, make a game. I'm like, how much time do I have? It's like 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I did it, but that was pretty funny. I actually just replaced Surprise with no game. I have a game called Mike Pixel that's about explosions <clears throat> and kicking people in the crotch. So I replaced kicking people in the crotch with hugging people and explosions with hearts, and I call it Hug Pixel. Instead of Mike Pixel. So once again, th okay, this is a story. How how is that for an introduction? Slightly better. Okay, so slightly. now I want a slightly better applause for <laughs> Alan Tsukoni. <laughs> okay, that, that's we can go with that. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, when Bob asked me if I could talk about one of my games, in particular Obitalis, I was very very excited. But you know, at the same time. I didn't really want to make, you know, another of those sort of pretentious post-mortem talk, hashtag Gamma Sutra. <laughs> I didn't want this to be, you know, yet another indie talk. And this is why instead of probably really talking about what Obitalis is, I'd like to tell you a little bit why the game it is the way it is. And, you know, there are many games that have captured people's attention, not just for the stories they tell, for the stories the game itself tell, but for the stories of how they have been made. And, well, the most obvious example is, of course, you know, in the game, the movie, which sort of binds games such as Fez and Super Meat Boy with a struggle of their development, regardless, you know, of how well portrayed and how actually true that was or not. But um, there are many other games, such as, I don't know, Depression Quest or Dysphoria, just to name a couple, which, despite not being exceptional in their execution, they can only be fully appreciated if you know the stories of their developers. And another example I can think about, for example, is um, Alexander Bruce Antichamber, which, you know, in my opinion, is um, one of the most innovative, brilliant, and well-executed indie games out there. Um, if you probably have seen Alexander Bruce's GDC talk in 2014, and if you haven't, shame on you, please, please go to see now, he's on the Indie Vault. Um, well, you know how emotional his journey has been. And feeling all those seven years of hard work, all you know, the amount of effort, all the hours he put into his game, feeling all that struggle, if you play Antichamber again, well, that itself adds a completely new layer, a completely new experience to the game. And, well, this is what making games for me as an independent developer really is. Games are stories. Games are about stories. And even if the game themselves, they might be fictional, well, behind most of them, there are real stories, the personal stories of people who, who make them. And knowing them can shine a completely new light, even to some whom you already play and you already know at perfection. Now, to quote Alexander, well, what people did is less useful than understanding why they did it. And this is why, if you want to really understand why a developer chose to make, I don't know, a game rather than another one, you need to understand their story first. And so I think that if you really want to understand why I made Obitalis, the game which I will show in a, in a few seconds, um, the way it is, well, I think you sort of have to understand the story behind it and how it turns out to be. Um, at this point, I think that, you know, as game developers, probably all of us, we have a game that has influenced our careers more than, and possibly our life more than any others. And for me, this game was Creature, which probably nobody knows. How many, how many people know this game? Oh, now I'm quite impressed. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that many people. Um, so yeah, basically it was for the people who haven't, who haven't played it. You can imagine like a sort of a Tamagotchi, but a good one. And you can see all these little creatures that you can sort of pet and slap. Um, and they have their own DNAs, and they have the neural network, which determines their behavior. 
they can talk with you, you can talk with them, they can reproduce, you have genetics. So it was a very, very good um, life simulation and probably still is, up to today, one of the most sophisticated artificial life simulation aimed to the public that you can play. And that, for me, was the first time when I realized that games, programming and biology, they could all beautifully fit together like puzzle pieces. And this is what ultimately led me to study programming. I wanted to be the best programmer so I could be the best game developer. And while my colleagues were all busy making database in Java, well, I used to make games, including this shameless Star Trek ripoff I made in 2002. And yes, you can see in a second like a Borg cube exploding. But <laughs> let's go with that. Um, so, well, what happened next from 2002? Well, I show some of my prototype to my teachers and my lecturers at the time. And their reaction was pretty much exactly the same, which was, games, really? Well, we only do serious programming in here. And if you're a teacher, don't, don't say ever that to anybody, <laughs> ever. Because, you know, after that time, I still wanted to make games. But, of course, after being so heavily discouraged from, you know, all my effort and all, all the time I was spending making games, well, I thought that it was not possible to make games as a living. It was not possible to make games as a living the way I wanted to be, you know, with exactly the stories I want to tell and the gameplay I want to tell. And so I sort of, I was keep, you know, making game as a hobby, but I sort of move, move away from that. I didn't want that to be a full-time job because I thought that was impossible. And um, so I moved to London and I started a PhD in neurotechnology. And before you ask, yes, there was an actual slide from an actual presentation I did at Imperial College. And <laughs> you can see we have um, fruit flies, we have lasers, we have robotic arms. We also have Lego bricks to hold the laser in place. So, I mean, come on, what could possibly go wrong with such an amazing setup? And well, apparently a lot, in fact, in um, 2013, unfortunately, I've been a um, victim of harassment at Imperial College. And when I reported it, unfortunately, the college kicked me out. And that started a very dark period in my career because, you know, I worked on that for, you know, 10 years and suddenly there was not an option anymore. And if you want to work in academia, doing a PhD, doing research is basically the only way to do that. So once you're kicked out because of that, there's no many chance you can go back again. And um, so, well, after that, you know, I spent a little bit of time, you know, like being very sad and stuff. And I did, I think, the only reasonable thing that every severely depressed game developer should do. So I joined Ludum there. And <laughs> I spent, you know, the following 48 hours to push both my strong passion for science and this feeling of absolute emptiness I had at the time into this little game here, which turns out to be a sort of bizarre gravity simulator disguised as a puzzle game. And you only have one enemy in the game, which is gravity. And gravity, as you probably know, always win. Um, so in the following days, Orbitalis became the most voted and commented entry on Ludum there at the time. And in the end, it didn't win. And I think one of the reasons is because, well, the game basically had no audio. And despite all my efforts, uh, you know, game developer never really buy the argument that there is no sound in space. So that didn't really work out. But anyway, <laughs> um, I think if you look at Orbitalis, something you can immediately say is that um, whether you played it or not, whether you like it or not, you see once, like you see an animation like this, and you will always, always recognize the game from a single frame. Um, you know, it's resolution, which is quite bizarre. It's color scheme, it's filling, the level design. You see it once, you always recognize. So, well, unique aesthetic, check. Uh, indeed, Orbitalis, you know, has that feeling that you see once, you always recognize it. But, and, you know, that might sound trivial, but there aren't actually many games out there that have that. And quite the opposite, the majority of games, they look very similar. And this is especially true for all those games that have a fixed style, like retro pixel art, you know, or low poly. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't believe me, if you don't trust me, just go on Google Images and search for, like, low poly game, low poly indie game, you know, like retro pixel art in the game. And you will see a lot of pictures, and it will be very hard to recognize which game is which. And, um, well, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Like, by itself, you know, having a game, having many games with similar styles is not bad. But, of course, this doesn't really help games to stand out, you know, especially in a market, like, in the games that is so densely overcrowded. Um, so, however, 
when you know when Indicate asked me to submit an artistic statement about Orbitalis, that's not really the answer I went for. Um, and you know, if if you want to keep talking about this, you know, if you want to have a pretentious talk about indie game, we cannot not talk about art. So we have to get this out of the way now. Um, so let's let's talk about art for for a few seconds, shall we? And well, I think that one of the basic requirements for art is probably to have an artist that makes it. And what you know, what are we talking about? I don't know, um, a beautifully crafted game or a super fun puzzle to play. Um, most of those games, they have been created with a specific intention. When you create art, usually you create with intention. Um, and, you know, if you're a painter, we can say that every stroke is indeed intentional. But um, there's a problem with that. Now, let's imagine for a second that you're a writer and that you have written a novel, which is uh, amazing, everybody's impressed, and this novel has a very surprising plot twist. Well, everybody's surprised but you because we have written the novel. And it doesn't matter how many times you reread your own script, you probably won't be surprised, because you know how it ends. And it doesn't matter how many times the act of creating something has somehow prevented you from fully appreciating the surprise within your own creation. And I think that, in a way, is one of the drawbacks of when artists try to create something that has to surprise people. Um, I think that... If you want to look at this problem from a different perspective, one of the issues is that when we try to describe art to the public, we try to look at art from the perspective of the people who are consuming it, from the people who are watching or using art. And rarely we see art from the perspective of the people who are actually making it. So I would say that this sort of first level of art is what I would call sort of intentional and probably is the lowest step on a ladder that sees artistic endeavor, you know, from the perspective of an artist. Um, you know, this, at this level, we have questions such as how much can you really enjoy your own creation? How much can you play your game and still be surprised? Can you keep playing your game despite having worked on so many hours and still liking it? And I think that this, as game developers, is a very important question if we, if we want to do it. And, you know, as you can imagine, the second step on this sort of artistic ladder is probably procedural content, procedural generation. And, you know, as you can guess, in most games, I've used procedural generation nowadays. And whether it's used to create dungeons, like in this, you know, in this example, or where you used to randomize your characters or to create items, you name it, there's probably a game that has done it. And, you know, from the first rogue to rust, you know, with different degrees of success, I'd say. Um, procedural generation, although, can and indeed does allow its creator to be surprised. Um, if we talk about, you know, surprise and, and, and games and procedural generation, we cannot not mention No Man's Sky, which is, relies so, so heavily on procedural generation. But, you know, even with its 1.8 quintillion, am I right, planets to explore, well, there are, there are just planets. There's nothing, nothing, nothing more but planets. And... Um, the reason is that when you generate content procedurally, you have to define exactly what you want to generate. You have a set of constraints, you have a set of rules, and you cannot escape from that. So, yes, there's a lot of surprise, there's a lot of space, but even in No Man's Sky, which has such, um, such, such a deep use of, of procedural generation, there's not going to be anything else but planet. There's not going to be anything else but what has been coded inside. And... Um, I think that this is a very strong limit of even of procedural, even of art that has been generated procedurally, and you know, in a way, if you if you give an artist a brush, he will never make a sculpture. And I think that's something we really have to think about when we're trying to um, to make a game that has an artistic value in it. And so the question is, can we can we go a step further in this in this sort of ladder? Can we do something that is not affected by this? And I'd say that probably the next step in this ladder is discovery. Um, you know. I agree with people who claim that art indeed needs a creator, but this doesn't apply to beauty, for example. And beauty doesn't need to be created. You know, there are ways to be discovered. And for an example, we can look at this beautiful iris. Um, it has not been created by an artist. It is indeed an artist who took a picture of it, but um, the flower is, has been created already. The artist only chose the perspective, the light colors and stuff, but the flower was already like this as it is, and you can't really change it. You can pick another flower if you want it, but the flower by itself is static. You cannot change it. And I think that this, in a way, allows um, us as game developer to 
peek into a different realm of, of artistic creation. Because, well, if, if we can create this with, with, a, with a camera, with photography, what can we do as, as game developers? Which tools do we have to sort of have exactly the same effect, but on games, on stories? And I think that, you know, just to, just to give you... Um, don't be scared. Don't be scared. There's no, there's no math. <laughs> just to give you um, a sort of glimpse, you know, we can look at these... Very, very simple equation that probably like every second grade student can, can understand. But what's, what's really amazing about it is that nobody has ever expected that behind such a simple equation there was lying this endless seas of complexity. And this in particular is a Mandelbrot set, if, um, a big zoom of it, if anybody has, um, has seen it. And I think that in a sense, fractals are just, you know, the tip of an iceberg that can be unraveled only with code and math. Um, this is exactly what I think being a code artist means, in a nutshell. In the same way um, a photographer took a picture of a flower and sort of unraveled the beauty around it from his perspective, as a code artist, we can exactly do the same. We can take something that is deeply hidden, in this case, for example, math or fractals or, you know, you name it, you try to find it, and we can, we can dress it, we can visualize it so that other people who are not able to appreciate that kind of beauty can actually see it. And, you know, flowers are trivial. Everybody can appreciate flowers. But how many people are able to appreciate fractal without visualizing it? And I think that there's a level of discovery inside that that cannot be replicated unless we use code, unless we use this powerful tool we have. And, you know, this is exactly what I wanted to do, in a way, with, um, with Orbitalis. Um, as, a, as a way, this is um, another very famous equation that probably you have known. This is Newton's law of universal gravitation. And basically, you know, without going into details, what it says is that if you have two objects, they attract depending on how big they are and how far apart they are from each other. Um, again, who could ever imagine that within you know, such a simple equation, which is even simpler than the one we've seen before, there is so much complexity. There is so much complexity that arises from something so simple, in the same way from creatures, in the same way from fractals. And um, I think that this is exactly what I wanted to do with Orbitalis. I wanted to show how under something that is so incredibly simple, there can be something that is deeply infinite complex. Um, in a way, you know, gravity, you know, fractals are something very abstract that we rarely, we rarely feel every day. But that's not true for gravity. We experience gravity on a daily basis, but only on such a small scale that we really cannot appreciate how amazing it is. And I mean, gravity doesn't only make apple falls. It actually determines the entire structure of the universe at this larger scale. And it's the same equation that makes apple falls and the moon rotating around the earth that determines how the entire structure of the universe is. And I think that this is incredibly beautiful and incredibly powerful. And it's something that I really try to exploit using Orbitalis. I really try to have a game that show, give a visualization of something that otherwise would have been completely hidden. And now, I know now a lot of people can, can probably complain about the fact that, oh, couldn't you just do a less pretentious game? Couldn't you go with a more natural, with a more common type of game. And indeed, yes, there are choices in Orbitalis that are making it less appealing to a broader audience. Um, first of all, well, the game runs at a very weird resolution, as you can see. It's a sort of square. But um, I really wanted to do that. I really wanted to make this choice, despite the fact that, you know, it's, it makes it very hard to bring it to, for example, port on mobile or port on, <coughs> sorry, port on other, you know, like... Um, Resolute screen resolution, but I really think that playing with uh, black space and playing with restricting what you usually can see is a very powerful way to remove power from you. It's a very powerful way of make you feel surrounded, immersed into the void, as if you were sort of like trapped into a space capsule or something. And so I was quite surprised to know that there was an actual game called Capsule, which did exactly the same <laughs> a couple of years earlier than Orbitalis and. Um, yeah, basically, in the same way, try to um, evoke feeling of like claustrophobia and isolation by removing the amount of sp the amount of, of space you can actually see on on your screen. And I think another choice that probably didn't really help um, Orbitalis is the fact that I really want very little text 
in, in, in Obitalis. And the game itself, when you play, it has no text at all. But it's, you know, it's very intuitive, so that by itself has never, been, has never been an issue. But it has been an issue for other parts of the game. For example, we have seen here a GIF of the, um, of the level editor, which it looks quite sweet with a blueprint effect, but um, the thing is, it's probably not super accessible to users. So that's probably another, cho another design choice with um, didn't really help Orbitalis, you know, to be available to um, to a greater audience. But um, overall, you know, even even with all sort of like um, design choices, let's go with that, that are sort of suboptimal from a marketing point of view, I think the game did really, really well. And you know, it got a bunch of mention, it got a bunch of awards, it got a bunch of nominations, and it went from Ludum there to Steam in 100 days, which, well, three years ago was sort of quite of a record. And, you know, for me, for my personal story, Orbitalis has been a huge success because it really helped me in a moment in which my mental health, you know, because of all the college drama was at its lowest. And this will always be true, regardless of how many copies it has sold, regardless of how many um, copies will sell in the future. Orbitalis, for me, has been personally a huge success. Um, you know... Traditionally, post-mortems so this sort of this time start showing numbers and copies, you know, and, and figures. And um, well, I'm not going to do that for the moment. And there are two main reasons why. One is that um, if you have a publisher like I did with Obitalis, um, most of the time you um, you are sort of strongly discouraged or actually forbidden by contract to talk about numbers. So this is one of the reasons why few developers can actually talk about how many copies they've sold and the numbers they're making. And, well, you know, another, um, another thing, big problem is that um, if we as developers share our numbers, well, this sometimes can be misleading. And I think that there are, there are, there are other developers which can use that information probably in the wrong way, unless unless you know it's 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 done in a in a, in a very in a very nice way. And just just let me give you an example. A couple of days ago, um, us to released this infographic about their mobile game Monument Valley, which probably most of people here have played. And yes, he made um, fourteen million dollars in two years, which you know is a lot of money, obviously. But um, you know, for the for the type of game it is, and from the scale of game, you know, it's 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 a reasonable amount of money. Now. <clears throat> If you're an average independent developer and you try to compare yourself to those figures, well, it's very likely that you will feel strongly unsuccessful and unachieved. So that's why I think it's very dangerous sometimes to um, share numbers. Even if numbers are low or even if numbers are high, it's, it's always dangerous to compare yourself. Um, well, another issue is that you know, people are usually more willing to discuss numbers and figures when they're big. And um, you know, failed games don't make headlines, but you know, big numbers do. Um, this has completely skewed the perception of failure and the perception of success in in, in this industry. Um, you know, if you want, if you want an example, think about Kickstarters. You know, we always read about successful Kickstarter most of the time. They make a lot of money, but what we don't hear is how many Kickstarters didn't actually did it. So if we if we if we take the ratio, it seems that the majority of news we heard about Kickstarters is stuff that got funded. While in actuality, that's a minority compared to the total. And this gives people the illusion that they can go on Kickstarter and make a lot of money. In the same way, it gives the illusion that you can make an indie game and make a lot of money just you know, out of nowhere, which is not necessarily the case. And I think that releasing sparsingly those, those information can be very misleading until we are, unless we have a proper overview of, um, of the landscape of, of, of revenues of, of, of all games. And, well, you know, I think that in the end, this hunger for games, this hunger for numbers is fueled by our need to compare games with other games. And this is really, really damaging to our community as, as, as indie developers. If you compare your game to games that are orders of magnitude far from you, you always feel like a failure. And, you know, in the end, success is something that you define because um, for your game and even more importantly, for, for, for yourself. Success happens when you actually meet your own expectation, but you are the one that set those expectations in the first place. So, you know, I think as developers, it's important to 
aim high to stay on board. But if you set unrealistic goals or if you aim to make as much money as Monument Valley or as much money as other games, well, you're always going to feel disappointed. And, well, I know that this talk was a little bit um, all over the place, but, um, you know, whether you have played Obitalis or not or whether you have liked Obitalis or not, I think that... Um, this whole in a way help you realize that you know behind every game, even probably the most soul crushing free to play flappy bird clone iPhone game ever there's a story, and that um you won't find this story on Steam Spy. and so please um go make whichever game you want it, whichever game you want to make, but don't let your game be about revenues and sold copies. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. No, wait. You wait right here because people have questions, or do they? Yes. Um, so, yeah, I'm curious. What's your process of adapting cool uh, biological or physical systems to fun game mechanics? Do you have certain tricks or heuristics you use? Oh, okay. Oh, I, did, I didn't see that, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I think I think it really depends. Um, I haven't actually done um, a game a game that I released for the public that is about including biological mechanics, you know, and that type of stuff. I think one of the issues is that if you use, for example, evolution, if you allow for real uh, biological mechanics in games to happen. You, you have very little control over the, the, the type of gameplay you can have. And this, of course, doesn't really help you, for example, if you want to make storytelling, because you never know what you're going to make. And it's very easy to do it the wrong way, the wrong way. And I'm quoting, for example, Spore, which was a game that a few years ago came out and was supposed to have evolution and all that kind of stuff, and it really wasn't. It really wasn't like that. I think that... Um, even creatures failed on the evolution part because evolution takes time over thousands of generations, millions of generations, and creatures never had the time to develop that. Even with Docking Station, which was this update that allowed you know, creatures to travel uh, across computers, we never reached the amount of generation required to have proper evolution in creatures. So I think it's really, really hard to do something that is not a sort of like fun aquarium to watch with with that, but um, you know, if you if you have any idea, let me know. We can we can discuss it after. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, don't be shy. Yes, please. Hi, thank Hi. you for your talk. It's very very interesting. I'm trying to compress all of that into one message, I guess. Um, I didn't manage to. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, that's why I'm trying to get my head around yeah. that. Uh, you're saying uh, every game has a story and yeah. uh, uh, make the game that you want to, to make. Um, should I interpret this as uh, take more risks? or um... Um, Not necessarily, because yeah. probably when you say take more risks, it's because um, the assumption is that you make games to make money. So making the games you want is probably not the game that maximizes your revenue. And this is... A common, uh, not a common misconception. This is something that really happens a lot of time. And you know, we can see on the App Store, you know, all the top games are games that have a very similar mechanic. So unless unless you're making something that is appealing in certain ways, and unless you use advertisement in a certain way, and you're doing app purchases in a certain way, it's very hard that your game will gain enough momentum and be picked, and it will make enough money to get marketing. So when I'm saying make the game you want to make, I'm not necessarily saying make the game you want to make and then release it and then make money out of it. I'm saying make the game you want to make, regardless of you can make money out of it or not. Of course, you know, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that take a risk and you know, uh, put a mortgage on your house to do a game. It means like, <laughs> please don't do that <laughs> yet. Um, it means the games can be very important, even, even if you do them just as a hobby. They don't necessarily have to be a work. They can be. But you know, use them as a tool. That's that's it. You know, and, and, and for me, for me, it really worked. Thank you. I cleared it up. Anybody else? Yes. Hi. Um, what I want to ask is, how would you incorporate? Um, because you mentioned about the story about how a game is made, but um, would you also advise incorporating or 
showing that to people in some way? Because that's kind of what I'm wondering about. Yeah, I think that it's quite hard because just just to go back to the example of Alexander Bruce Antichamber, um, from his game, you never know the struggle he had making his game because this is not something that is obvious from what he's doing. Um, to me, I only managed to do that when I saw his GDC talk. And when I played this game again, it was a completely different experience because now I see, oh, I see how much time he spent on this thing. I see how much time he spent on this level design. I see all those things. So to me, that's, that's, that's a very hard thing to do. You can, uh, you can always go you know, the opposite way and making a game about your story, but that sometimes is not necessarily what you want to do. Yeah, exactly, more of a story. So I think that's, um, that's I think maybe, you know, um, for example, always using Antichamber as an example, um, in the game there are special rooms. The, um, the, I think they call developer rooms or something like that, where you can see um, the time you have spent in making the game, all the prototypes, all the stuff. And I think that's a very nice way to reward a player because they're playing in the game, so you're not breaking the game by itself. But you can see, you can have a glimpse on how long it took just by showing, for example, a room with 2001, 2002, 2003, and see how the game evolved. And I think that these sort of, it worked for Antichamber because, of course, you know, it's a sort of meta game, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it might not work, I don't know, in Dark Souls. <laughs> you know, you might, you might break, you might break the, um, the thing. But, um, you know, it's, it's not something you necessarily have to do. But uh, if, if you have the chance, you know, you might... You might so to perhaps uh, inc um, to keep better track of uh, the development process and to make it more accessible to people then even if not internally via the game well I, th I think that's definitely definitely something that it might be helpful even just for yourself you know but doesn't necessarily mean that um, yes behind every game there's a story but the question is is your story you're going to tell help will help the game or not because sometimes, like, if you're, you know, you can also be the type of developers that its story behind the game is, oh, we got a commission to make this game and we made it. You know, and, and maybe, you know, it might not be an interesting, appealing story. But if, f f at least for what I know, most indies have a story, which is usually about struggle and desperation. <laughs> but, but that's another point. Um, but yeah, maybe that story is worth telling because maybe it can help other people. But, you know, if it's, the, the, I think it depends on the story, it depends on the game. But. Can be done. So it's worth considering. It's, it's definitely, some, definitely something worth considering, yeah. Anybody else? Great, that's it. Alan, I, yep, okay, <laughs> one more. Yep. Um, I was curious about your restriction of field of view, and you said you had a problem if you were going to develop it for, for mobile yep. or any other platform. Um, would you consider, you're still considering this, or you're... Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe not, also because the game has been made in Flash, but don't tell anyone. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to, <laughs> it's a little bit hard to, to port. So if, if I had to make it on mobile, reasonably, um, I had to redo it probably in Unity or something, so it's going to be a very different game. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that investing all my energy into remaking the game into Unity as it is will be worth it. So maybe I can make a second installment, but I'm not a fan of, of that kind of that kind of thing. You know, it seems to me more a way of milking money, you know, from, from a game and I'm not sure that's the type of things I want to do at this stage. But um yeah, I think it's um to go back to the limitation point, um as as players we are always used to have certain things for granted. Like we always used to be to know that we can control the player. We always used to think that the entire screen is for us to watch. And all these kind of assumptions, if you break them, you can sort of provide an interesting experience to the player. It's something you can definitely use to play with if you want to sort of change a little bit the, the thing in the game. Anybody else? We still have time, so don't, don't hesitate. Okay, great. Alan, no, I, there's another one. Yep, there's another one. Another one. Great. <laughs> great. That's cool. Just, guys, don't, don't hesitate. <coughs> Hi, it's it's a little bit of a mean question because Orbitalis please, did, please. <laughs> did quite well financially, so you can support yourself with your game. And from that perspective, it's really easy to tell people to just make the games they like. But how would you advise them to survive? 
Because there's a lot of people who, who want to do yeah. full-time games. Well, um, speaking of that, yes, Orbitalis did sort of financially well, but um, it, didn't, it didn't as well to uh, fully fund me till now. The game was released, I think, three years ago. And up to now, I, with the money's making today, I won't be able to just survive with that. I think that probably the biggest advice is that a lot of people want to make a game. They want to make the game that makes millions of money and that makes them rich, or at least, you know, that, that, that makes them independent in that sense. That, that makes the indie part of, of, of indie true. Um, and I think that's very risky, because most of the time it doesn't happen if you look at statistics. And, you know, it's not, you know, it's just the statistics. There are so many games, and so few of them actually makes money. So I think that it's, it's very hard to make a single thing that makes a lot of money, but it's relatively easy to make a thing that makes a little bit of money. So probably a better strategy, a more effective and reliable strategy if you're a game developer and if you want to stay indie, is not making a big thing, but making a lot of small things. And all together, they can make a little bit of money. You, know, you don't have your own game to be played by one million players, but maybe if the same person can buy your game two or three times, you know, if you make if you make two or three games. Of course, this means that you also have to ship stuff very quickly, which indie developers are traditionally not good with that, <laughs> including myself. <laughs> but yeah, I think that would be probably the, um, the biggest advice I would, I would give for that. Anybody else? I'm going to wait a bit now. Take your time. You know, I should, have, I should have used biscuits. I should have used biscuits last time for people who give questions. It would have been one million questions. But. Yeah. The moment I will start speaking, <laughs> somebody is going to raise their hand. Okay. <laughs> Probably not. Alan, I think, like, I think your talk is, should be called not another indie talk because it should, is... Should we change it now? <laughs> yeah, change it now. So <laughs> it's touched a lot of subjects. Like if you want to make indie games, there's like, there's a lot of good things that are going to happen. Like, uh, like we're here, you're here, I'm here. There's a bunch of other indie developers here who made it here. But there's also a lot of terrible shit that's going to happen and you're going to like roll on it. You're always going to die. Yeah, you're not going to die, but it's going to be terrible. I like the point that you made about like not trying to make money. Yeah. Because like if you want to make money, it will cloud your judgment. Just try to make a good game. Yeah. Not try to make a game that sells, but games that people want to play, right? So thank you, Alan. Thank you for all the points. Thank you for your story and thank you for taking your time and thank you for being here. And please, applause for Alan Tsukoni. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. Thank you.